Good morning everyone! I hope you have had your coffee and are ready to go on an adventure today. I don't know about you, but I think of the movie The Lion King when I think of the giraffe, the lions, elephants, and other large animals. This is the idea that I have in my head when I hear of the word savanna. So today, I would like to present to you the savanna taking a look at the circle of life. The savanna is home of the safari and it supports the Earth's most famous wildlife. The savanna is a tropical rainforest's much drier counterpart. Shown here is the Koppen Geiger class climate classification. If you look at the lower left among the blue shades, you will find the tropical savanna designated as AW or AS. A which means tropical and WNS as winter and summer. The savanna, along with the tropical rainforest and tropical monsoon, is found along the equator. The largest areas of the savanna are found in Africa, South America, Australia, India, Myanmar, Thailand, and Asia, and in Madagascar. It is also found in isolated strips in southern Mexico, some Caribbean islands, in particular Cuba, and in southern Florida. Depicted here is the annual temperature and precipitation of the savanna regions. We have Brasilia, which is the capital of Brazil, Bamako in Mali from the continent of Africa, Mount Isa in Australia, are all within the tropics and have a distinct wet and dry season, which is characteristic of a savanna. Here is the Holdridge Life Zones chart, where we can find the savanna to the left of the tropical forests, where annual rainfall is reduced and is in between of the thorn steppe or woodland, or very dry forest. However, the savanna is unique in that it experiences quite long periods of drought. The savanna we know has a characteristically long dry season, but also has a wet season, and this transforms the landscape of the savanna as the water changes throughout the year. During the wet season, the landscape is lush and green, and most of the plants are tall and short grasses. There are also low-lying shrubs and some trees. The savannas are usually a transitional zone between a grassland and a forest, but savannas have trees like in a forest. However, unlike in a forest, the trees are more, much more sparsely distributed and features an open canopy. This means that sunlight is able to pass through the forest and grasses are able to grow and cover the ground. The image of the Serengeti in Tanzania is one that we think of when we say savanna, where the field plains is a long stretch of grasses, but it is actually distributed with trees and shrubs despite the dry season. As the savanna features an open canopy, sunlight is able to pass through. As the dry seasons in the savanna are quite extensive, brush fires commonly occur due to heat and sometimes lightning strikes. Through adaptation and evolution, large trees and some plants in these ecosystems are resilient of the damaging effects of fire and are able to bounce back even without intervention. These fires are ecologically important to the sustainability of the savanna. Some birds take advantage of the fires by preying on the insects that are up and about fleeing from the heat. As the fires burn the grasses, ash and organic carbon is being returned to the soil, contributing to the soil fertility. During the rainy season, plants are able to thrive due to the water and the stored organic matter as an energy source. The tropical rainforest is more biodiverse, but the savanna boasts in the number of great and large mammalian wildlife. Such example is the Brazilian savanna or the Cerrado, which is one of the most biodiverse savannas in the world. It has 800 tree species, 1600 species of mammals, and birds and reptiles. Now, let's talk about the characteristics of the savanna. Soil fertility is generally low in the savannas as water has periods of scarcity. 
It was documented in Belize that trees are able to facilitate nutrient uptake coming from deeper horizons. Organic matter is also deposited in the soil where it is decomposed and eventually releases nutrients. Surprisingly, about 30% of the total organic matter is decomposed by termites. Nutrients are therefore stored in the termite mounds, which led to a practice in Thailand where they mechanically break up termite mounds and it is being spread on the top of the soil surface to increase fertility. Another documented phenomenon in Kenya is where termite mounds above ground serve as floodproof areas where uh, grow shrubs and trees are able to grow with a span of grassland in between, called the termite savanna. Despite being dry for most of the year, the savanna is alive and full of life. Flora in the savanna have evolved to have roots that are able to penetrate deeper into the soil layers and have a roots that are a characteristically larger network. The plants and the trees have structures that are able to store water. Such example of uh, a drought resilient tree in the savanna is the baobab tree or the baobab tree as others also call it. This tree is iconic and is prehistoric. It is actually not a tree but a succulent. It is composed of layers of fibrous plant tissues which you can harvest. The A. grandidieri is the largest and most majestic of all of the species. But unfortunately, despite its grandeur and its fame, it is facing threats due to slash and burn, overgrazing, overexploitation of the bark and the fruit, it is an endangered species. It is pollinated not by insects, but by bats and by lemurs. The fruits and seeds are actually a superfood and is a very valuable food source. The bark is used as ropes and to build roofing. The huge base of the trunk grows about 3 meters in diameter and about 30 meters in height and can store up to 120,000 liters of water. The bark is grayish in color and is able to retain water by reflecting heat. So some more common plants in the savanna are the sturdy palms, cacti, and succulents. And if not trees, are large shrubs which are loved by grazers. Here is the acacia tree, which is also an icon of the savanna. Here are only a few of the diverse grasses uh, within the bio. And of course, most familiar to us is the mamosa podica species. So allow me to introduce some of the world's most famous savannas. First off, we have the Everglades in Florida, which is a flooded form of a savanna. Well, this, a savanna is determined by the amount of precipitation which is received in an area and not the presence of bodies of water, hence the Everglades being categorized as such. It is a habitat to reptiles such as crocodiles and snakes which swim between the many clutches of grasses we can find here. So up next, we have the Cerrado, which is located between the Amazon Atlantic forests. The Cerrado is the largest savanna uh, in the region in, of South America, and some locals actually refer to it as the Amazon rainforest's ugly cousin. <laughs> The biome is home to at least 11,000 uh, plant species, and 45% of that actually can be found only within the Cerrado. The Cerrado is home to at least 11,000 plant species we have mentioned before, and this is referred to as the upside-down forest, where the roots and symbiotic fungi sto uh, store soil organic carbon, which can access water deep in the ground. And the hydrologic cycle that occurs here is uh, its neighbor, the Amazon, is quite dependent on. Brazil is now the second biggest producer and leading exporter of soybeans, most of which are grown in the Cerrado. So first, it is threatened by agriculture, and next is the leading uh, cause of deforestation, which is cattle ranching. 
The Cerrado is very biodiverse, but it's heavily threatened by agriculture, and this has resulted to many species becoming endangered. So due to the rapid deforestation and the onslaught of climate change, we can see the threat of irrevo irrevocable damage within our natural ecosystems. So many unique species can be found in the Cerrado, such as the jaguar, the blue-eyed dove, which is critically endangered, about 30 individuals known, and a few of the many endangered and threatened species. We have the giant anteater, the marsh deer, the main fox, which is actually not a fox but a wolf, the three-banded armadillo. Up next, we have the African savanna, which is the largest in the world. This is the most famous within uh, the African savanna, which is the Serengeti in Tanzania, which is called the home of the Great Migration, as it is the only place in Africa where vast land animal migrations still take place. Each year, more than 1 million wildebeest travel in a circular migration across the Serengeti. And of course, it is home to one of the continent's highest concentrations of large mammal species, including lions, hyenas, zebras, giraffes, and elephants. Most members of the fauna in the savanna are herbivores, which have strong legs and commonly come in herds in order to protect themselves from, of course, predators. Allow me to introduce to you some of the many inhabitants of this biome. The African elephant is the largest mammal in the world and can live up to 70 years. We have the lion, which is an apex predator and the king of the safari. Most of uh, the big cats, uh, such as the cheetah on the left and the leopard on the right, which is distinguishable by their spots. We have the rhinoceros, which are an endangered species due to poachers. The giraffes and the zebras, which are common herbivores. The very cute meerkats, the migratory wildebeests, gazelles and other antelopes. The impalas, which are slightly different from gazelles, and are most common uh, mammals, animals in Africa. Some animals unique to the savanna, uh, which is the colobus monkey, spotted hyenas, mandrills, and other primates. The cassowary in the Australian savanna, the lilac-breasted roller, and the grey-necked crowned crane. Now, allow me to show you the food web in the savanna and the role each creature plays in this elaborate relationship within this ecosystem. Producers in the savanna are the grasses such as the red oat grass and star grass which are consumed by the primary consumers, the herbivores such as wildebeests, gazelles, topi, and small rodents, and of course by insects. The elephants and the zebras also graze on grasses. Impalas and giraffes graze on trees and shrubs. The pangolin, the aardvark, and mongoose are secondary consumers which consume small insects. Our predators, some of which are uh, also scavengers, such as the African wild dog, uh, one of the most endangered mammals in the world. The hyena, which also consumes a fellow predator. They belong to clans, a territorial social group. The cheetah, which is a solitary hunter and the fastest land animal with speeds up to 113 kilometers per hour. The caracal, which is the largest of the small cats and are territorial and solitary. The serval cat, which eats uh, small animals, rodents, and insects. And unlike most cats, they do not scavenge and eat leftovers. 
The repulse vulture, which uh, prey on large dead animals. They are very social birds and are the highest flying birds in the world, uh, up to 37,000 feet. The lions, uh, the king of the savanna, live in groups called as prides, where the females are the hunters. The tawny eagle, which is an opportunistic scavenger. As for decomposers, bacteria are the dominant colonizers compared to fungi, which are far less distributed. So, like all ecosystems, uh, decomposers play a very important role in the energy flow, which will return nutrients to the soil, and they serve as energy source for the producers. So, allow me to share uh, some stills from the movie The Lion King, which was inspired by the actual savanna landscape. Here is Pride Rock, which was inspired by the Dota Mountains in Kenya. We have the African, sorry, Elephant Graveyard, inspired by Dalol, Ethiopia. Cloud Forest, which is also inspired by the Mount Kenya forests. The Reflections of Mafasa, which is actually in a big lake, is inspired by Mount Kenya Lake. The Masai Mara featuring acacia trees, which is very famous uh, in photography. So uh, there are far much more wonder left to explore beyond what was uh, shown here today. From the flora and fauna, from the herbivores and the predators. As I always say, there is science in creation's intelligent design. All members of the ecosystem are all connected. From the soil we rise, and ashes and dust we return, and thus the cycle continues. The earth is what we all have in common. We share the earth, and therefore we also share the responsibility for caring for it. And with that, there goes the life in the savanna in full circle. Thank you.